Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to another mobile mapping webinar. Um, today's topic is the Trimble MX9 for rail applications. Everybody is uh, put on mute. If you have questions, please type them in the question box that you should be able to see on your screen. And we will cover the questions at the end of the webinar. I'm today, today's uh, webinar will be presented by three of my colleagues. Um, Piotr Strelecki, the field application engineer covering the Europe, Middle East and Africa area. Marco Bello, um, sales engineer focusing on the mobile mapping solutions for the same Europe, Middle East and Africa region. And Isma Medinic, Trimble track survey and scanning sales engineer. Today, we're going to specifically talk about how a Trimble MX-9 mobile mapping system can be used for rail applications. And we're going to go through some specific setup considerations for those rail applications. We'll go cover some of the pre-processing steps there and considerations around that. Then we will look at um, feature extraction for asset management, um, again, uh, adopted for rail applications. And then we also look at how Trimble MX-9 data can be used for some other high-end workflows again, for very specific rail um, applications. And then as said at the beginning, um, at the end, towards the end of the webinar, we'll uh, be able to uh, cover some of the questions you might have. And with that, I'm uh, immediately going to hand it over to Piotr. Piotr, your turn. All right, thank you, Ronald, for the introduction. So let me just um, share my screen now. All right, so now you should uh, see the presentation. Just wanted to confirm if you all yes. so can hear me well. All good. All right, thank you very much. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon. I wanted to start with uh, some starting point of the MX-9 and on the presented workflow that I'm going to cover. So when we consider the MX-9 uh, mobile mapping system, this consists of a few elements. So first of all, this would be a sensor unit, which is like the eyes of the full system. Uh, it's equipped with uh, two user adjustable laser scanners, uh, class one, adjustable in both vertical and horizontal two users adjustable front cameras, each five megapixels, one back down uh, looking camera, also five megapixels, one spherical 360 camera, IMU, um, which is an AP60 or AP40 is the option. And we also have a one laser scanner, uh, scanner option. Uh, so from the sensor unit, we have uh, one single cable to transfer data and power from the system to the control unit, which is like a brain of the full system. It's computers equipped with the SSD disks to store the data and also equipped with uh, multiple interfaces um, to connect uh, to the user control unit. So then we also have a power unit, which is like a heart of the system that provides power to the full uh, system. So then we have also a roof rack, uh, which is like a skeleton of the MX-9 to easily install, mount or dismount the MX-9 sensor unit from your current installation. All of this is con controlled um, by a user control unit, which is actually a web-based field application, field software that can be installed and, well, that can be used on any tablet or any kind of laptop. So the work, typical workflows with uh, the MX-9 is to collect the data uh, with a TMI, data collection software in the field, then we have some processing for the navigation data, and then processing uh, scanner data in Trimble Business Center, which allows to generate scans, to georeference scans, uh, also to colorize the scans and create regions. 
and then output data to different types of applications. And, uh, well, let's say that I, I am presenting here two paths. One of them is to Trimble MX uh, for a production. It's more for feature and assets. And the other one with, that we are also going to cover today, it's more for rail type of application. I would say engineering type of application, which is a GDOSCAN office tool for rail production and analytics. So what is so special about MX9 for rail? Generally speaking, that's different when it comes to installation and initialization of the system when it's uh, on a rail and not on car. On a rail, actually, the installation itself has to be, uh, has to be well organized with a client and it's uh, typically done on a siding or on a dedicated platform. Also, the installation of the system itself is always individual. There are some special mounting systems used for rail kind of applications. Um, timing and scheduling is also uh, essential for rail, and initialization process of the system uh, will be a little bit slightly different comparing to the cart car installation. By the scheduling itself, what I mean is that it's done on the tracks. Um, very often this may happen that the tracks are actually also used by other trains with a higher priority. So the installation itself and the measurement needs to be uh, discussed with the customer, we should consider the schedule, the timing, and the timing might be actually really, really um, precise, so we have to skip, stick to this timing. Uh, we also should uh, consider a proper platform or locomotive arrangement, like a dedicated platform, uh, power arrangement, Ethernet cable length, antenna, GAMS antenna installation. Um, also, initialization part should be uh, considered um, as this is a system moving only on a linear kind of path on the tracks. The initialization is slightly different comparing to the car uh, initialization. So, I'm going to talk in details about all of these elements uh, in the next coming slides. First of all, let's talk about the installations. So here, two typical installations on uh, um, platforms. So you can see that there are some designs done uh, for the roof rack to be installed um, on, on the um, rail platform and, and then the MX-9 installed there. Mm. When we think about the data communication now in between uh, the system and the operator, the operator will be typically sitting in, in a cabin in, uh, in a locomotive, and the system will be at the end on the platform. So as the system itself has a Wi-Fi uh, connection, this may be actually out of range, and we consider that using Ethernet cables uh, it's actually a preferred way for connection in between the control unit and the operator. If the cable uh, will be also uh, longer, the user also should consider a Ethernet switch uh, to provide uh, the data exchange. Now, how to power your, your system? So the, the power uh, to the um, power unit of MX9 can be actually delivered from the uh, locomotive electric system or can be delivered from a separate standalone battery. Uh, just consider that the battery used has to be um, uh, powerful enough to provide power for initialization, for the measurement, and for possible breaks or pauses if the MX-9 will, will have to stay on if there are some other um, trains passing uh, due to priority of the tracks. 
Uh, the MX9 sensor unit itself has this installed on a platform. Uh, it has to be considered to make sure that we'll have a visibility for the lasers. We also need to make sure that the GAMS antenna um, will be localized and uh, properly and it will have a proper um, sky view. Um, then the cable length, the power and the data cable from the sensor unit to a control unit is five meters long. And as the control unit and the power unit of uh, the MX-9, they are both not weather resistant. They have to be stored in a kind of cabinet. So if you install the MX-9 on a platform, uh, on a kind of installation which is high, this five meters uh, cable length is something that we should also consider. So some uh, close up uh, to the installations. I have the MX-9 sensor unit installed over here on this, uh, let's say, extension. And now the GAMS antenna installed on this extension here. That's another uh, type of a setup presented. So uh, summarizing the installation, we should consider first of all that the lasers uh, will not hit uh, the platform itself or the bumpers of the platform. So that's one important thing. Uh, second important thing is to uh, provide space uh, for the installators, for the operators to actually put the MX-9 on this extension here uh, on the roof rack, which uh, uh, we should provide some space on the end of the platform because doing this from uh, from the ground level may be extremely challenging as there is quite a height difference here. Uh, we should also provide an extension to install a secondary uh, GNSS antenna, the GAMS antenna, and remember to consider um, length for the cables, right? So the sensor unit to control unit cable, then control unit to a power unit, power unit to a battery supply, and then at the end, uh, the, the data exchange in between um, the field software and um, the unit itself. So the Ethernet cable uh, to cabin. Now let's cover the initialization for rail. We will, um, I would say that GAMS antenna, and what is GAMS? GAMS is a GNSS azimuth measurement system. So that's a secondary antenna that we install together with uh, DMX9, and this uh, allows to uh, provide a precise heading uh, pitch roll and yo um, solutions to the system. This part of uh, the system is actually essential here. You would have to use uh, the GAMS antenna for rail type of applications. Why? Uh, it's uh, basically due to the um, IMU drift. Um, for the rail type of applications, we actually uh, move in a linear way. So there are not a lot of changes for the IMU itself. So that's why um, the initialization and also uh, the trajectory calculation, we will use the GAMS antenna. And having said that, uh, GAMS antenna have to be, has to be installed and measured very precisely uh, because small movements, small misalignment of this antenna uh, will create more errors for, for the data. So that's why we recommend to use the focal station or a, a terrestrial scanner to measure um, the lever arms in between the MX-9 system and the GAMS antenna. Uh, if that's not done extremely precisely, there can be some improvement done with our post-processing strategy for the trajectory here. So um, initialization it itself might be quite challenging due to this um, linear movement of the system. So 
So I would just say that as soon as, soon as the user will see green um, part of the TMI software of the expected RMS uh, position, uh, just go ahead and measure. Or if within a few minutes you will not see more improvement in the expected accuracies, just leave it as it is and uh, go measure. As said before, there, we can still do some post-processing improvements for this. Um, also for the initialization, we have to consider that it will take longer distances when moving on a track um, comparing to car installations to get initialized. Uh, you may need to move backward, backwards and forwards um, during the initialization. However, also on some tracks, it's only allowed to move uh, uh, forward within a specific sensors that actually opens and closes the, uh, the passings of the cars um, with the tracks. So that's uh, also important to consider. However, as said, as, you, as soon as you see green and no improvement anymore in the accuracy, just go and start your measurements. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the registration uh, to ground control points. And this part of this presentation um, is the project that we have collected together uh, with uh, Gotronix Distributia, uh, who is a Polish uh, Trimble dealer. So uh, we did some tests actually with the registrations and with different kind of uh, ground control points. So here you'll see that three types of uh, ground control points have been used. So there are two checker mar uh, checkerboard marks and one is like a triangle shape. So the first one was like 30 by 30, uh, second one 30 by 20, and the same size. Actually, general recommendation for Trimble Business Center uh, is to use 50 by 50 when it comes to the ground control points. And this photo that you see here, they actually come from uh, from uh, the, the from the MX9 itself. Uh, within this project, uh, we have distributed ground control points in a three different distances in between them. So every 30 centimeter, 30 meters, at uh, the beginning of the trajectory, then on the curve every 80 meters and then 120 meters at the end. And uh, we just wanted to see and verify how the distances in between ground control points influences the accuracy of the registered um, point cloud. And that's why we have also chosen some uh, validation points marked here with the triangles. So we have some zoom in here for this part of the trajectory and also for the one that uh, has more density of the ground control points. Uh, we also did this measurement of the same part of the track twice with two different uh, speeds of the train with uh, 20 kilometers and with 50 kilometers. We wanted to see how the speed of the train, so we all, and the vibrations of the train, of the platform, of the whole system itself will influence the data quality and the point cloud quality. quality. So here uh, one can see that with 20 kilometers, the point cloud is actually uh, more dense and it's easier to pick, uh, to pick up the point uh, which is coming from the checkerboard. So that's actually how the checkerboard uh, looks like uh, from this data uh, in the point, point cloud. So it's easy to pick up exactly the point that you would like to uh, select to correspond to your ground control points. And then 
that's a preview of a 50 kilometers uh, data. So you see that the, the point cloud is less dense, and this may actually happen that we will not have the exact point that we would like to select here. So um, speed has some influence on the data quality here. Uh, so there is a table here with the residuals. All of these residuals are in meters for both type of speeds. And we can see mainly on the elevation um, data quality that um, the more dense uh, the control points are, we can be more precise. And also speed has a uh, an influence on the um, on the accuracy of the ground control point of the point cloud uh, to ground control point validation. All right. So now I would like to um, move uh, to a real uh, project and show you how uh, the point cloud and the uh, from the MX9. Uh, looks in a, in a Trimble Business Center. So that's a preview of a short run uh, within a Trimble Business Center with uh, the point cloud that is already uh, colorized. So if we zoom in, you will actually see that uh, the platform is uh, available here. We have the poles. Uh, we also have some uh, buildings, trees. So all the objects are, are referenced and also tracks are well uh, shown on a, on a point cloud. And uh, having said that, I also wanted to show that Trimble Business Center has a kind of a, has a classification uh, for the point cloud regions. This project is actually already classified, so I will just show what kind of classification options we have. So I'll just go here to region color, and then I have multiple regions already classified. Let me just zoom out and move a little bit. And here in a view, uh, filter manager. So default, that's the uh, region that was not classified. This cutoff and fences, this is actually the regions that I have created manually. But then, let's maybe do like this, that I will deselect everything. I can just select my poles. So that's the poles and signs coming from uh, the automatic region classification inside TBC. I can select high vegetation, so that's that will also have some trees here available. Then let's go for the buildings. Right, so there are also some buildings available here for uh, for further uh, usage. And then uh, ground. Right, so that's, uh, that's all the rest that's, uh, that was classified. So having point cloud uh, from the Trimble Business Center you can actually export the data now to different types of software. And now I'm just going to hand it over uh, to Marco Bello. So thank you. Thank you, Piotr. So I'm just going to share my, my monitor. Okay, I think you should be able to hear my voice and see my my screen yes yep. it's good all right okay um so in the case the in the case the the applications your company is uh, is uh, is focusing in is going through asset inventories of all the assets you might find on a railway track um you might like to use uh, uh softwares like Trimble mx the one i'm showing you right now on the screen which gives you the capability to extract features, extract points, polylines, polygons, with all the relevant attributes uh, which are linked to the features you're going to extract. 
From Trimbo Business Center, uh, the software Piotr showed you earlier, you have the chance to export your mobile mapping into TMX format, which means Trimbo Business Center will produce the spherical imageries from the 360 cameras and will produce the point cloud colorized or not, depends from the way you like to work. And, and this mobile mapping data set along with the trajectory can be loaded into Trimbo MX. And this is what you can see right now on my screen. On the top, you see a 2D map view where I simply have loaded a WMS online maps representing actually the, the, uh, the location where the, the, the track is. At the moment, as you can probably recognize from the, from the images, this is a, this is still a, um, there was still a construction site. There was a work in progress, so the line was not in place yet. And the blue dot you see as overlays on the maps is the camera positions, which means is the locations where the camera has been triggered to collect the panoramas. On the bottom, on the left, you can see basically the spherical 360 image collected at a specific position. And the specific position is the one highlighted by the number one here from the uh, 2D map. And then on the right hand side, basically you can have a view on the on the point cloud itself. In this case, I'm colorizing with the intensity with the grayscale intensity. So this is the point cloud generated and um, and visible uh, on the in TMX in this kind of view. Of course, uh, to make life comfortable during the extraction or production um, steps, you can always detach different views from your screen and put those in different monitors to make your life easier when it comes to extractions. Um, talking about the extraction workflows uh, itself, normally um, many organizations, uh, maybe they already have their database containing the definition of the feature classes they, they need to extract with all the attributes. And um, in many cases, maybe this information is stored in database available in some uh, remote servers or maybe servers located in different uh, offices from the, from the organization. In that case, uh, what you could think about doing is uh, connecting this software, connecting a TMX asset modeler um, software to this existing database. Um, we have the chance to connect to multiple databases. You can see here the drivers which are available. And as soon as you are able to establish a connection between TMX asset modeler and the database and the tables of the database, you are basically able to import uh, in TMX the features which are already available and, uh, and stored in that database, which means you have the chance now to revisit them with your new mobile mapping data set and maybe change the attributes of this according to the visual inspection you can do from the cameras, pictures, or edit according to new measurement you can do from the imageries or from the point cloud and feed the database with fresh new information concerning specific attributes. So this is a quite common way to proceed uh, in doing your asset inventories or populating your database for your assets. Uh, differently, uh, what you could also think about doing is uh, creating from the scratch your own layers. For example, in here on the left, you can see there is uh, this kind of resource, uh, small window with the resources I have loaded at the moment in this project. And you can see the very one on top is, uh, is just a layer which I call the rail signaling, which is basically uh, a layer where I'm going to store the assets, signals, which I'm going to extract from my a railway uh, data sets. So in this case, this year has been created physically here from the scratch, but you could also think about importing, for example, a shapefile or a DBF file containing these attributions, information, convert them into, into a layer for TMX and start extracting the data following the same definitions which are already existing in the shape or in your DBF file. Um, navigating wise, you can navigate via different in different way. You can navigate in your 3D view, uh, on your point cloud visualization. You can navigate just using some short keys from your keyboards. Uh, for example, jumping image by image, just using some shortcuts which you can customize. And uh, basically, following the trajectory of your mobile mapping data, you have the chance to navigate through your uh, data sets. 
identify the objects you would like to measure and then perform your extractions. And this is what I'm going to do right now just to show you uh, how TMX uh, is going to work. Um, as I said earlier, I have created my own layer. You can work with your specific coordinate system. So there is a database of coordinate system available, which you might like to apply to your specific projects. You also have the chance to import a, a line to be used, for example, as a, as a reference um, uh, for the uh, um, as a reference system for your uh, extractions of the of the features. And um, when it's time to start doing the extraction of your objects, it doesn't really matter if you want to work from the camera views or from the point cloud view. As a matter of fact, I also have the chance to overlay my point cloud exactly on top of the, of the spherical image because cameras and, uh, and the point cloud itself are absolutely calibrated. So uh, there is a perfect matching between point cloud data and imageries. It really depends the way you would like to work. And um, having to do the extraction of these features, you can simply go to the asset inventory menu of your software and, for example, specify an inventory you would like to work with. For example, this one is the layer I created earlier. And as this is going to be a point layer, which I, as I told you earlier, you can extract point, polylines, or polygon. In this case, I'm working with the point layer. Actually, you have the chance to pick up the options you would like for the extraction of the points. You could simply create, uh, you could simply click this to just uh, create, uh, extract the position of uh, 3D coordinates of, uh, of, uh, of the signs. But I would like to do something more. Actually, I would like to use this tool here, which would give me the chance to extract the position of the sign of the, uh, of the sign I'm interested in, and also maybe the height respect to uh, a reference horizontal plane which I'm going to identify right now picking on the point cloud and for example I will use the, the plane which is represented by the two rails which are visible here on, uh, on my image view and also from the point cloud view. Uh, let me just do that so I select this option I am going to pick on the top of one of the two rails and you see the, the software identifying a horizontal plane or defining the horizontal plane and then I'm going to, I can actually also zoom in a little bit if I would like to, and then I can pick one point on my road sign. As soon as I'm doing this, um, the software computed for me the 3D coordinate X, Y, and Z of the point I was picking on the road sign. And actually you can see the result of my operation as well in my, in my point of visualization. And then you can also see that uh, by using this option and having customized my extraction procedures, automatically the height of this point respect to this horizontal plane has been transferred to the database. So basically what I'm trying to say is that I don't have to manually do this measurement, but this can automatically populate the specific field into the database. And this is possible because when I created this attribute, which is the height to, well, actually it's not the road, but it's a rail. But when I've customized these attributes, I was making use of a formula. So there is a lot of formulas in TMX you can use to automatically store the result of the computation done by the software inside a specific, uh, a specific field of your database. For example, it could be the distance from a road sign of, of, the, of the signal respect to the center line or the alignment, and could be a, a component of the vector stored in case I'm measuring a slope distance, something like that. As well, this is also attributes which has been um, which I, as I've been creating or customizing myself earlier. And uh, what I have customized here is also a list of possible signal uh, which is uh, representing the, the the features I'm finding all all the way through my track. For example, assuming this sign I was uh, picking is a I don't know is a giveaway symbol, I would just pick the option I'm interested in. And then I could switch to the other condition. For example, condition, which condition is the, in which condition is this symbol? Does this need to be visited by an operator to take some actions? Does this symbol or signal has to be replaced by an operator? And I have the chance to pick the right option uh, just based on the visual inspection I'm doing uh, from, the, from the imageries. And uh, once this is done, I can click on the next and go to the go to the go to the uh, to the next object. I have the chance to save my operation. And what is also interesting is uh, 
of course you can see the result of your extraction so the points visible as overlays on the point cloud visualization and as well from the from the spherical image and if i'm going to select this object i always have the chance to revisit maybe to edit the attribution in case something has been defined wrong by the operator who did this, this uh, extraction but um, you also have the chance to um to let me just save and close this procedure the software when you do the extraction is also automatically saving the the views so the mobile mapping views which were active when i did the extraction uh, for example you can see here that i have a jpeg image actually two jpeg images one showing the point cloud from the point cloud view and the other one showing the spherical uh, basically this is um, if i'm going to open this this is the image which was a uh, uh, the software is doing a kind of uh, screenshot from the from the views which has been opened and the interesting thing is that these images can be used later on uh, in your data management system for example let's assume all this data you are extracting are going to uh, to be used inside a a kind of uh, ArcMap environment or RGS environment. Well, these images can be displayed as well as additional attributes directly into uh, into ArcMap. So you can create hyperlink or HTML pop-ups and display uh, these uh, these images uh, uh, as ad as additional attributes. And then you can proceed in you, through your data sets. I mean, um, I was showing how to pick a point, but at the same time, for, for example, if I show you the, the measurement tools, you have the chance to measure points. You could measure distances based on the on the point cloud, for example, I don't know, um, something like this. And then you, you have the chance to, uh, if this measurement is linked to the attribute, these values can be stored directly um, inside, the, inside your database. You could measure a line, uh polylines areas circle volumes catenaries and uh, different ways to uh to extract the features you might be interested in and then uh, tmx has been developed following a really a kind of gis um, platform philosophy uh, as a matter of fact if you are an expert arcmap user you might recommend a lot of functions which are also which are also available and visible in arcmap and uh, for example, I can do a right click here and I can see the attribute table, which is something which is very similar to what we have in, 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 in our map. And you can link your attribute table with your object by clicking on here so that you can actually visit uh, each of the objects you have in your attribute map just by clicking on the line specific to your, to your object. And uh, you also have a chance to make a selection. You can make queries in order to filter out specific uh, signs, for example, by definition type, by condition, by distance respect to an alignment. So you can filter out and do already some uh, analysis in here. And um, once the data sets have been uh, extracted from TMX, uh, there is different way you can consume your data. One could be exporting very basically a shape file and this shape file may be loaded into ArcMap. Or you could even think about sharing the result of your extractions with uh, with your office or with other offices, uh, maybe located in different locations. Uh, and this is possible making use of the publisher. The publisher is a cloud-based environment where basically you have the chance to display your mobile mapping data and the vector data you have extracted in a, in a street view kind of environment. Um, let me give an example with the same data sets. So I have been uploading on the publisher, the mobile mapping uh, data sets I was showing you earlier. And now if I'm going to log in to the publication with the username and the password, here I have the chance to, uh, to connect to the same data set. Um, let me just, Customize a little bit better the visualization. You have the chance to open spherical views as, as I had in uh, as I had uh, in, uh, in the desktop version of TMX. You have the chance to decide um, if display the point cloud yes or no as overlays on top of your images. This visualization can be turned into a 3D one, 
And very similarly to what I was doing, uh, I was showing you earlier in the desktop version. Also in here, you can you have the chance to uh, navigate, inspect the data sets in case um, the, the administrator of the publication uploaded the result of the extractions, which means the vector data like the, the, the points or the polyline, which has been already extracted earlier about the specific assets. These assets would be visible as well as overlay on your spherical imageries as well as on your point cloud 3D visualization. And also, if you have been enabled by the administrator of the publisher installation, you also have the chance to do some measurements. As you can see also here, there is some uh, measurement tools. Similarly to what we have seen in the desktop version of TMX, you can measure points, distances, lines. Well, you have less options, of course, from the publisher respect to the desktop environment. Um, the publisher itself, we consider this environment mostly a data sharing environment where you can share the, the mobile mapping data and the result of your extraction to your end customers or with different organization of the same company. As I said, of course, you also have the chance to do some, uh, some measurements, uh, basic measurements, but this is mostly a sharing environment. Um, the publisher can be probably considered more a tool uh, relatively to production when this is linked to a plugin. Um, let me just explain. For, from, in TMX, we are offering plugins. Uh, we have plugins for ArcMap, QGIS, Autodesk. We provide SDK to create your own uh, plugins for your own specific applications. And um, the plugin is actually creating a bridge between the software platform you're using, for example, ArcMap, and the dataset publication, for example, this one. Uh, by doing this, you could, for example, use ArcMap to create your layers, your layer definition, layer structures, attribution, and the extraction can be done from the mobile mapping data by the plugin, and all the results to be stored into the layer organization created into, into, into ArcMap. Uh, let me give you, just to conclude my part, a quick um, overview about how the plugins is working. I'm going to switch now to the second monitor. Uh, I hope you can already see that. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Thanks for the confirmation. Um, let me just hide this if I can. Okay, so here on the left, um, here on the left, you see ArcMap. And, and, uh, and here there is, a, in, in this ArcMap installation, I've been installing the plugin, and this is the very small toolbar for this TMX plugin. What I'm going to do now is just start in the plugin, and as soon as I do this, actually TMX is opening um, a link to my browser, and here I am. Actually here, I have the chance to sign in to, my, to the publisher, in order to uh, in order to establish a connection with my uh, publication, and uh, in this case again, I'm going to use my uh, I'm going to use my railway datasets. Just give me a second because I need to take uh, I need to take the link for this. Uh, I'm going to take the link from this publication. You know, let me just copy this link. Let me close and um, let me go back to my plugin. Similar to the publisher, once I, I provide the link to the publication, I need to provide a username and a password. I need to sign in and I can say I would like to open the MX9 Dresda Railway dataset. And then I'm again connected now to the same publication, but interesting now, you see that on the fly here on the in my map from ArcMap, you can see actually that an area has been defined, and this is the area which is covered by the mobile mapping data sets, which is now linked to ArcMap. Um, you see, uh, you see, I have one visualization which is open, which is the number one here, which I can rotate. And if I'm going to rotate this, you can see that 
uh, I can see the rotation in a visible 2D map of the, of the publication of the plugin, but also in my arc map environment. I can zoom a little bit more on here. Um, maybe what I'm going to do here, just to have a clearer data sets, I'm going also here to, uh, what is that? To, I wanted to display like the resources, place my map, image view. I don't want to have the overlay of the point cloud in my, uh, in my publication. So I'm closing the settings, so I just hit them. And then um, in ArcMap, I have created two layers. So one, for example, for signals and another one, for example, for, for lines, could be whatever, whatever kind of lines. And um, I, what I can do is I can move my location uh, maybe to um, probably maybe a more interesting site, maybe somewhere somewhere like here. And here I have uh, um, my spherical images. I changed the location, my, my location I changed also in, uh, in my arc map visualization. And what I would like also to do is maybe why not also in this case adding a spherical, uh, sorry, um, adding a point cloud scene. Uh, let me just zoom in a little bit. Oh, I think I need to change the color of this. Okay, it doesn't matter. I need to change the color, which is at the moment was, uh, I think, was still uh, in black. And this is why I cannot see that. Oh, let me just change this in 3D view. Okay, I keep this one open. It doesn't matter. And I close this visualization. You have the chance to uh, change the rendering of your point cloud by reducing the, the pixel size, if you like, uh, reducing the changing the colorization from the RGB to uh, to intensity or by height. Uh, so very similar to what I was showing into inside the, the desktop version. Um, now um, let's assume that I I am interested in extracting uh, using the plugin the, the plugin some uh, some informations. For example, here there is a there is a box. Let's assume that this is a signaling uh, element. Uh, I would like to I would like to extract and save into my ArcMap databases. And um, what I can do is uh, I can enable this layer for editing because actually I want to write into this layer. And once I am in this visualization in my publication, I can go here and go to measure. When I go to measure, I can open the measurement. For example, this is point, because this is the point layer I have been creating in ArcMap. And then I have the chance to pick on the points, on the, in this case, from the 3D view. And you can see on the fly, this position is visible here in my ArcMap. And what I can do now is just click in here and say, this extraction into ArcMap. And then I can navigate and I can go to, to a second element. Um, again, I might like to, to use the, the point cloud or the images, doesn't, doesn't really matter. You can really decide which, uh, from which environment you, you want to do your extraction. For example, I'm going to extract just, just, to, just to see how it works again. Another point here, and then I'm going, I'm going to save this, uh, this as well into, into, into my ArcMap layer. And um, I show you something quickly uh, uh, about the line extraction. So once I finish it with this layer, you have the chance to go and uh, save your uh, save your editings from here. Save edits and then stop editing. And then maybe you can switch to your second layer. So right click and then you edit feature, you start editing here. This is a line layer. So instead of using the point extraction tool, I will use the line extraction tool. Then I can pick this one, and for example, I can start digitizing. And interesting is that you can see in, in the real time on the left part of the screen that the lines I'm digitizing are coming active and alive on the on the on the on the arc map environment. I can do my double click, and also in this case, I can do saving my edit so that this line is has now been saved on the active layer in arc map. And by the way, you could also save these the extractions here on your uh, um, your publication, and then export them locally, for example, as a KML file. Um, there's much more, um, but time is, is getting short. So in case, just shoot questions, if you have any other questions uh, concerning the publisher and the publication. And I think I'm now going to pass the ball to Ismar for his part.
thank you very much, Marco. Um, Ronald, would you like to show this um, presentation? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm changing the screen now. Okay. 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 So, one moment. Yeah. Uh, so today I will as well give you a little bit overview about the GiroScan Office software, what we are doing, and how we can utilize as well uh, the data which is which are uh, collected from the MX9 system. Uh, before coming to the GiroScan Office software in, in more in detail, I would like as well uh, to the audience who is not so, uh, let's say, related to the rail business to introduce our company, Trimble Railway. So uh, we are developing for 20 and more years uh, railways, uh, railways uh, measurement systems. This actual generation of the trolley is since 2011 on the market and today's focus is scanning. So I'm presenting, um, uh, I'm presenting and uh, I'm the product manager for the, for the scanning application, uh, rail related. Uh, so how we are utilizing our, our trolley, our trolley is, uh, let's say a hand push system in comparison to the MX-9 system, but uh, has its benefits, which you will see uh, later in this presentation. Uh, so the scanning, the scanner which we are utilizing can be a ferro scanner, it, it can be as well a TX8 scanner and uh, it is mounted on a uh, trolley system, so we are pushing the trolley along the track. So we can utilize a so-called uh, Guido scan system. This is a system which is giving us uh, the point cloud uh, with the rail, with the full rail environment. So we can use it for uh, relative measurements. We can as well combine it with absolute uh, sensors like uh, um, uh, total stations, like um, GNSS and uh, IMS systems. So the IMS system, for example, uh, the combination of IMS and Guido scan is the latest system we are offering uh, since 2017. And it gives you really a high uh, performance scanning with very high accuracy. Uh, of course, um, for to, to um, cover the full geospatial scan solution, we are as well supporting the MX-9 system. So in our software, of course, uh, and as well some terrestrial uh, scanning applications with the TX-8 or TX-6 scanner, but as well S610. Um, and next slide. One moment. Yeah. Uh, so nevertheless, where the data is coming is coming from, uh, we what we are getting from the system is always a, a point cloud in a, a let's say a global coordinate system, and we can as well uh, what we are what we can do in our GiroScan Office software is a full set of uh, rail specific analysis applications. So uh, the rail applications are covering are covered from the object registration, from as built track extraction. That means I have the point cloud. I want to get uh, the track information from it. I can um, I can as well extract some platform or uh, edge informations, for example, pipelines in tunnels or let's say platform uh, uh, areas, uh, which I will show later in my live presentation. We can as well uh, extract uh, automatically overhead lines, which are very important for the uh, for uh, some of uh, network railway authorities in the specific countries. Of course, the main focus of our, let's say, GitoScan Office uh, application is the clearance analysis. So what we are doing, we are pushing, we are pushing a, a virtual a clearance envelope through the point cloud and looking after collisions. And of course, we can uh, document these 
kinds of collision. So uh, the files, what we are uh, getting, uh, we can, uh, we can let's say, uh, analyze the point cloud. We can uh, export it further to any other specific specific uh, software packages. We can uh, we are uh, generating 3D overhead lines, for example, in DXF or CSV format, um, and of course clearance clearance reports. Uh, so coming back to this topic, uh, we are uh, what we are getting from uh, uh, from TBC is the full uh, is the full uh, georeference point cloud from the from the MX9 system. So we are uh, uh, so the mobile mapping system is collecting the data. The processing is uh, typically done in, in TBC, and we are getting via the TDX, the Trimble Data Exchange Format, we are getting the point cloud into our software, very easy and, and convenient. So we can use the applications uh, from GiroScan Office, which are mainly, let's say, the track S-Build geometry extraction, um, the object registration and extraction, and the clearance analysis and documentation. So this is about, let's say, uh, the theory. Let's come to the uh, practical part. Now I would like to show, uh, I need the presenter role. Ron, uh, Ronald, yeah, thank you. I hope you can now see my point cloud. Yep. Great. Okay, so this is a point cloud which is generated by the MX9 system. So uh, what we need first to do in uh, at the very first step is to extract the rails from it. So we have uh, we don't have the information about the left rail coordinates, right rail coordinates, center line, about the gauge, can't and so on. But what we are uh, uh, what we are uh, able to do in the software is to extract these information based on the point cloud. How we are doing this? We have a special uh, function called track detection tool, and uh, we can um, select the uh, appropriate rail shape. This is the MX9 rail shape. Um, we can select, we, we are seeing the uh, visible part, the rail inclination, and so on. And so here we can say start free detection. Uh, to start with the detection, we need to select on the left rail two points with a simple left clicking. So the software is now uh, is now uh, let's say uh, adjusting or putting the reference uh, the reference rail shape which I uh, which I selected. It is putting on the point cloud on the rail itself, and we are we are able as well here to let's say uh, a, a little bit change the gauge or change the inclination using these buttons which you have here in this in this functionality. At the end, you press here uh, start rail detection. You say accept and proceed, and then the software is starting to go along the track you see here a graph uh, which is uh, my my current setting is three meters so after every three meters we are doing this um, we are doing this uh, track detection so as you see here in this graph we are getting some confidence level this is the percentage uh, of our rail shape which is uh, which is all being overlapped to the point cloud so this is a kind of um, a kind of confidence so we can be sure that we are really detecting the uh, the track itself uh, what we are getting what we are examining uh, along this along this uh, procedure as well is this um, gauge information so we are now around 1540 uh, the gauge and the current information around 100 millimeters. So we are in a curve now. I can uh, at any at any point I can press stop, and we are we can get a 3D view of the detected area what we have here in the point cloud. So you see here we have detected every three meters with a very high accuracy. We have detected uh, the uh, the track itself, and now I can as well save this track as, for example, track. And when I save this track, I can take it down here. Moment. Uh, you see three. You get three lines. So the lines for the left trail, uh, the right trail, and the center line. 
So what you can get as well out of this is uh, what customers are uh, interested in is other information about the coordinates here. So we can uh, do an easy, let's say, uh, complete track format export. And I can name it, for example, as track two. And the information which you are getting out of this uh, detection is that uh, you get easting for the left trail, so easting nothing elevation, the coordinates for the left trail, for the center line, for the right trail, and we are getting as well the count information and, uh, and gauge information. So this is typically this is typically the, the main focus uh, of this uh, track detection, but as well, it is giving us the base for any other functionality to show here inside inside of the software. As we are getting out of time, I will uh, I will be a little bit quicker only to show what we can do as well in the software. So uh, we can uh, move around uh, around the along the uh, track which we have detected. We can as well simply left click on some points here on uh, let's say this catenary and we are getting the lateral and height information on, on the bottom left uh, area of the screen. So you are getting beside of the coordinates, you are getting as well the left rail, uh, the uh, lateral and height offset and as well the inclination, the count uh, of this specific area. What we can do as well in the software is to uh, uh, is to use the overhead line. So how it's working, I'm simply clicking on a point here and then the algorithm is going along the point cloud and is detecting is detecting the overhead line. The overhead line is being detected uh, so long as your as your track is long, and in the end uh, you are getting uh, you are getting uh, a polyline which you can export as well uh, to DXF, for example, as a 3D DXF polyline and so on. I will uh, cancel this here at the moment. Uh, so you see here as well a graph uh, in the bottom area where you see the lateral. Uh, you see a green line and a yellow line. So uh, green means the lateral, uh, the, the position, so the lateral offset and uh, yellow means the height offsets to, this, to the center line under consideration of the count. So this is, as you see, a really real specific analysis, which is uh, required from our custom customers all over the world. At the end, for example, you can store uh, this line here and as well, uh, you can export it here to a CSV file, for example, or a DXF file, and uh, you can use it in any other, uh, for any other applications. Um, what I would like as well to show here uh, at this step is um, um, the most most uh, mostly used tool from our software. This is the uh, collision check of our software. So I will uh, step over to another MX9 data set. So I hope you can see now you can see now this uh, this point cloud information. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you have, for example, here, uh, you would like uh, to do a collision test. How you are utilizing it uh, in our software? It is very easy. You start only the collision test tool. You select the appropriate clearance envelope or clearance profile which you uh, want to check to, and uh, you can select uh, the area where you want to do the collision test. For example, here I can select it with shift left click, shift right click, and in the end you press start collision test. So what the software is doing, it is taking this this uh, clearance envelope which you see here uh, in orange color and pushing it virtually along the track by considering the curvature and the count information. So we are going millimeter for millimeter over the track and checking uh, if anything is inside of this clearance envelope what we are what we are uh, what we um, what is inside of this clearance envelope will be detected as an encroachment and will be colorized now uh, will be colorized after the collision test and you are getting uh, such result so you see here for example i have here obvious collision here with this catenary pole if i zoom in here more, uh, I can see. I can see that this is a really huge, huge um, 
let's say a collision to this specific envelope which i which i uh, which i use for the collision test so what you can as well do is to simply uh, change your view to section view and to take a, a nearer look to any points of here so you see if i click somewhere here on the left uh, on the uh, with the left mouse button i can see from this uh, catenary pole from this outer side of the catenary pole i have all, uh, 1.933 millimeters my lateral offset to the to the uh, to the center line here but as well i can use let's say in some countries they have specific uh, requirements to use uh, to get the information to the nearer rail, for example. That means if I click click somewhere here, I get to the left rail the information about the about the lateral and height offset. Um, what after you have uh, after you have uh, detected your uh, collision, what you need to do is uh, as well to document it. We are offering. Uh, uh, several uh, types of, of uh, documentation but the most used documentation is the DXF documentation which I would like to show you quickly so uh, you see here I would now I will do here uh, um, I will do a, a cross section at this step I can specify I want to take one plus minus one uh, meter to put everything together inside the point cloud and I will call this uh, section I will call this section, let's say uh, cross section, and I will uh, create the profile. So what is the software now doing? It is pressing uh, the whole point cloud together, the whole point cloud together by considering as well the, the, uh, uh, the twist and the curvature. That means the twist is the uh, change in the in the cant. So, for example, you can as well do this with with whole tunnels. For example, you have a tunnel of 100 meter, and this functionality is giving you the possibility is giving you the possibility to press the whole tunnel of 100 meter together and to check one single envelope here. Um, um, to get the DXF, you uh, open uh, another Guido Scan analysis software here. And you select you select this um, cross section file which you have which you have exported from Guido Scan Office. So this cross section file is looking like this. So this is the whole uh, MX9 point cloud which we have which we have exported now. I can easily uh, let's say delete some points if I don't want to consider them. So uh, this is a, a simp uh, this is a pre uh, compressed uh, uh, 2D point cloud, but I, what I would like to get is a vectorized line, which I can uh, uh, further process in uh, in AutoCAD, for example, in any DXF uh, format. So what, how we are doing this uh, this vectorization? We are taking from the uh, from the first uh, sub window to the second one. We are taking it down, and we are getting the vectorized point cloud of uh, of this uh, cross section vectorized uh, line of this uh, uh, of this cross section which was a point cloud so now we are dealing with uh, now we are dealing with vectors and i can as well now take it down and here you are getting the same information like you was getting here so if we change for example this section view you see here that this envelope, this same envelope, is as well uh, described here. So you have different, let's say, uh, possibilities here. You can edit lines and so on. You can do automatic annotations, for example, uh, like radial annotations, or you uh, you want to get the annotations uh, constant to, uh, uh, you, you want to get it perpendicular to the line segments, or you would like, for example, to get the information uh, to uh, get the information of the overhead line. So you are getting these kinds of information. In the end, for example, you can uh, uh, give a client name, for example, webinar, and you can export it as well to, uh, to uh, DXF. So I will show you what you can expect uh, out of an output. So this is here. This is this 
uh, report what you are getting. Everything is in meters. It is in a predefined template of Trimble, of course, but uh, you can change it easily to your one and uh, you get all the information, center line coordinates of the, of the cross section, the gauge, Kant information, and so on. So uh, everything is layer based. So if you want, for example, don't want to see the dimensions, you exclude them. If you don't want to see the collision, you can exclude them. So it is uh, a very easy and nice tool. So usually we had we have projects where kilometers of track needs to uh, be documented every 10 meters. They need a clearance uh, check. So what you can do in our software as well, you can say I want to take multiple profiles from the beginning to the end with a step of every, let's say, five meters, I want to export uh, easily every five meters, for example. In this case, I want to export cross sections and I want to automatically automatically uh, um, get TXF reports out of, out of it. So these are the applications uh, which we can cover with software. There are as well some other applications like a shape tracing tool, uh, only maybe one minute because we are 10 minutes uh, over the over the um, over, over our schedule, so you can select here easily a point here, and you are getting you are getting the information you are getting the information about the uh, about this um, about this shape. So I have defined a shape here. So I'm clicking on the point cloud and I press OK, accept, and then the software can go if you want automatically around along the platform station and get all the all the information about the platform edge. These platform, this platform edge what you see here as a blue line can as well be can as well be uh, exported as a DXF or as a, a CSV file. So you are getting uh, so you are getting all the information, all the coordinates and the lateral and height offsets you are getting to uh, um, to Excel, for example, I have here an example platform station. So you get the coordinates of all detected points in a specific uh, grid you wanted, and you are getting the heights, uh, the height and uh, lateral distances to the center line or to the mirror rail, whatever you are interested in. Um, I would now like to conclude with this uh, presentation. So, Ronald, would you please? Uh, I will stop my. Yeah, would you please go to the last side? Okay. Yeah. So uh, for the for the conclusion of this of this presentation, I would like to uh, underline that the uh, MX9 is not a substitution for the Guido Scan system. Both systems have their uh, advantages, and both systems complement to each other. So based on the on the project circumstances, for example, the Guido Scan system is idea for a couple of hundred meter uh, to to uh, to for example to cover uh, many construction sites in. in in the world are a couple of hundred meters up to five kilometers, for example. And for this kinds of application, it is not worth to organize a complete train with the MX9 system and so on. So it is, uh, it is much easier, for example, to utilize the trolley. Uh, the trolley as, as well has, let's say, the advantage that it's measuring really the gauge and Kant information very precisely. So, for example, the gauge information is on one millimeter accurately uh, measured, which is very important for the network railway authorities, which need needs to know there is built um, there is built uh, track information. And as well, the Guido Scan system offers a clearance control in real time. So using a, a TX8 system, which you see here on the picture, uh, you are real you can really check in the field, you see immediately if I have a collision or not. Uh, the mobile mapping system as well has uh, its advantages that it's used uh, mostly for for longer sections railway and for railway tasks it has it is an integrated system uh, from for from many sensors like uh, Piotr and uh, Marco explained about and uh, the big thing is that all the data which is getting get by uh, the mx9 system we can directly use in our Guido scan office software so uh, at this point, I would like now to stop and uh, I'm free to any questions from your side. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Smar. Um, yeah, we have run about 15 minutes over time, so I think um, we need to uh, we need to close this. If there are any other specific questions that people might have, please feel free to um, use the uh, email address that's shown here on the screen to reach out to us. Um, note that the webinar is also recorded and that we will be sharing a recording link uh, or a link to the recording uh, tomorrow to everyone who has registered as well. And uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, Piotr, Marco and Ismar for the presentation and um, wish everybody a very good day. Thank you.